My name is Adam. And I'm Destiny. We spent a year converting an old swap bus into a fully functioning tiny home. We started a company, sold our home, and hit the road full time. Together with our dog, Brew, we are redefining the concept of home. We believe that we are always in a state of becoming, of learning and growing, and finding fresh perspectives. And although we have sold our home, we do not consider ourselves homeless, but borderless. We are not confined by four walls and a yard, but instead have adopted an even bigger yard, one we cannot wait to explore. So this is our story, the story of how we are becoming borderless. After we replaced the bus engine in New Mexico, we made it exactly six days before we broke down in Atlanta. Turns out we were given a faulty engine. And while the mechanics and the insurance companies and the manufacturers argued who was at fault, we moved out of the bus for a few weeks because we had some international work to prepare for. Well, we are taking brew down by the ocean for our nice walk. And one of the things we were talking about on this walk was just how fortunate we are to live this lifestyle and to travel around the world and to bring back what we've learned and incorporate it into our lives, which is kind of one of the reasons we ended up doing this tiny living thing anyways. Because one of the things that we've noticed when we're traveling is people have less typically, but they have more emotionally, relationally, and just overall joy of life. <laughs> Um, and so we kind of learned by the process of experiencing that when you have less, you can have more. And so that's what this lifestyle for us has been, and that's kind of where it was inspired by. But this conversation led into a whole nother place. And that's the point in the conversation we wanted to bring you guys into it because in case you didn't know a lot about us, uh, we have had the opportunity to travel outside of the U.S. and with that there's some places that have just wowed us. And yeah. so we're gonna play a little game called Top Three Places. We're each gonna tell you our top three places we've been so far in the world. This is subject to change, yes. but just so you have a little bit of fun facts about us. Yep, so drum roll, please. I don't know if that's a drum roll, but. That was kind of a drum roll. <laughs> we'll start from the bottom, work our way up. My number three place I've been is in Bali. It was the rice fields and just for so many different reasons. For one, the landscape itself is beautiful, the greenery and just, the, the way that rice is grown is kind of mind-blowing. If you don't know what it looks like, Google it. Pictures itself are amazing. Being there in person was really cool. Also, this is like a way of life for people. This is how people make a living. And people just do it for their whole life over there. And also, rice is a big part of so many different diets. And yeah. rice is my favorite, one of my top favorite foods. I love rice. I could live off of rice. So it was just really cool to see it in person. Yeah, my favorite food is pizza. So my number three is in Nicaragua. Now we've been on a mission trip with our church several times down there. We've partnered with this organization that builds uh, uh, schools for children. And we always take a day to quit digging and then we go hike this volcano, which is active. And then we run down it, which is super fun. But at the top, there's just like this chain of volcanoes that darts the landscape. It's super beautiful, it's super pretty, and it's one of my favorite places to go. So my number two is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. It was an amazing trip I got to take a couple years ago while I was in college still. And I actually got to see it at a time when it was still in the process of bleaching, so it's not as degraded as it is now. So I was pretty thankful to have been able to see it when it was still lively and vibrant. Um, but also just knowing that, like, this is a structure that can be seen for that can be seen from space. That's amazing to me. And swimming in it, and I actually got to sleep in a boat and wake up on sunrise and like have the sunrise well, over the cool. Great Barrier Reef. It was so cool. Uh, there's just like a lot of things we need to know. Is people don't realize that what you're doing right now, wherever you are in the world, it affects our coral reefs. Like a quarter size sunscreen that. You use kills an Olympic sized pool of coral reefs if you're not using the right sunscreen. So just becoming more aware and just how we can impact the environment is just, it's cool to me. So it was a really neat experience. I can't wait to see the Great Barrier Reef someday. Number two, King Kling. I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it, but it's over in Bali. Actually, it's an island off of Bali called Nusa Penida. And it's just this giant rock that over looks this beach that's like way down there and you're on this cliff and the only thing to keep you from certain death is like these little bamboo sticks that are tied together <laughs> and then it's just this massive rock it looks like a dinosaur it does look like a dinosaur and it's beautiful and it's just it's mind-blowing just how how pretty some of the landscapes can be over there um out looking the ocean with the palm trees and the water it's beautiful Number one. Number one. So my number one is Khao Sok National Park. Pardon me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. That's a good it's one. in Thailand and it's a freshwater lake. 
uh, freshwater like lake yeah. reservoir we went yeah. to and it is no joke just like turquoise so yeah. like photos aren't even technically that photoshopped and you don't have to photoshop. the photos don't even do it justice that we were getting over there because they're also these really like mass rock structures that come out of the lake it's fresh water you can go swimming you can see everything we got to have our own private tour yes. and it was on a really cool local boat and it, it was awesome that was that was a an experience that was like a, a very very cool yeah. experience so my number one is from our most recent international trip. We went over to Iceland to explore and then Finland for a wedding. Uh, and then while we were in Iceland exploring, I found the coolest place ever. Actually it got shared to me by a friend, but he told me to go there and it was like my most mind blowing number one place I've ever seen in my entire life. So let us show you our Iceland trip and you can guess where number one is for him. <laughs> yeah, let's show you. When you land in Iceland, they make you watch an informational video before they let you leave the plane. This video is full of useful information for tourists like places to visit, national speed laws, and a reminder not to stop in the middle of the road to take photos. This was surprisingly more difficult than it sounds. Driving through Iceland was delightfully challenging. Not because of the road conditions, the weather, or the amount of sheep running across the road. Fun fact, there are double the amount of sheep than there are people in Iceland. What makes Iceland so difficult to drive through is the amount of times you have to stop to take in the landscape. You might have a two hour drive to your next planned stop, but I guarantee you're going to stop at least five times to take photos of mountain ranges, black sand beaches, wildflower fields, and glacier fed waterfalls. When traveling internationally, we try and follow these three rules. Drive as much as possible, learn something new, and climb a tree. I say road trip because driving is the best way to experience a new land. It'll get you where you want to go fast, but is also slow enough to allow you to take in your surroundings. You get a taste of what local life might be like, and with good tunes and good company, there really is nothing greater than a good old-fashioned road trip. So when it came time to learn something new, destiny took over the wheel. But We're out, of, we're out, clutches down, brakes down, I'm in first, brakes off, easing up. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to have the parking brake on. So I'm fine. I really do know how to drive a stick. So how do I take it off? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Whoa, nice. Wait, 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 wait. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta shift it to third and you gotta keep going, man. You drove, good job. And then it was time to climb a tree but there really aren't any trees in Iceland. So I climbed a rock instead. That was awesome. It was cool as we there. I was like, whoa! And I climbed, and now I'm out of breath. Did you see it? I'm wearing like three pairs of pants right now. We parked. <laughs> way down this road. Adams were in like four layers right now. And there's a plane crash. It's that way. They said, just get on this road and walk. Two hours. Two hour walk. Two hours. There and back. So I'm basically telling you all that to say this. When you come to Iceland, you don't have to do this part. 
I'm doing it for you. And I'm about to show you what's out here. Because there's sand here, and there's sand there. And if the wind blows right, there's sand <laughs> all right here. So you can skip this part. We arrived in Iceland during their first weeks of summer. This usually means 40s to 60s. 40s at night, 60s during the day if we're lucky. Summers in Iceland are a lot different than what we experience back in the States. For example, the sun is out 24-7, literally. Also, a lot of the country is in bloom, green and floral everywhere. There were wildflowers for miles, or as far as the eye could see. see giant ice cubes and so look at these giant ice cubes <laughs> one huge thing I wanted to see in Iceland is was puffins and they say it's very common to see puffins in Iceland this time I'm not there everywhere, but I have not seen one puffin. Um, so I'm determined to see some puffins before we leave. My wish did not come true. I didn't get to see puffins, but we did get to see Icelandic horses. When we arrived in Iceland, we tried to acclimate to their time, but then we realized there were so many tourists out during the day. So instead of fighting the jet lag, we kept our natural sleep cycle. And this meant we were staying up all night in Iceland and sleeping during the day. This had two advantages. One was that we would have about four hours worth of sunset lighting. In the photography world, we call this golden hour. The second advantage was having no tourists out at 2 a.m. So we got to experience all the places and sights to ourselves. So it's about one in the morning now. Uh, you can see the sun's kind of sort of setting. Uh, we're going that direction um, about an hour and a half there to see the most unreal waterfall I think I've ever seen in pictures and hopefully it lives up to that in real life. Um, so we'll probably be back here at 1 in the morning. Th well, no, it is 1. We'll be back about 3. But it's nice and empty now. Um, so hopefully we'll have the waterfall all to ourselves. And I'm super excited. So we came from way down there in the valley. And then we hiked all the way up here. We've got glaciers over here. Volcano over there. But that's it. That's the waterfall, all the way down there.
this was one of the prettiest waterfalls we have ever seen, and yet it did not even compare to the Secret Valley. The Secret Valley was a spot that a friend told us about. This place was so beautiful that it made its way to number one on Adam's top three places he's been in the world. We got to see and do a lot in Iceland. We got to see a geyser in the Blue Lagoon. And we found a thermal hot spring out in the middle of nowhere and had it all to ourselves. We got to see a crater. We got to see the Black Church. Adam even found a soft patch of grass to take a nap. We met Sam and Dan, and Dan did this, and Sam said yes, and we were lucky enough to take photos. All in all, we think Planet Iceland should be on everybody's bucket list. Just make sure you go during their summer. Welcome to Finland. <laughs> How do you like Finland so far? I like it in the summer. Summer is nice. Because it's warm and warmer. And it's green everywhere. Yeah. Which is great. What are we doing today? We are shooting, uh, photographing a wedding in Finland. <laughs> At this beautiful church. This is a really nice church. It was built in like 1400 and something. Uh, and our friends Rico and Brooke are getting married today. And we have been kindly invited along to document the experience and we're bringing you along with us. All right, so in the past, we've had problems at churches kind of traditional churches where we couldn't go down there to take photos, but these guys are super cool. Finnish people are like the happiest people in the world, but they said we can go anywhere except behind the red U-shaped thing. We can go anywhere down there on the floor. This place is great. How you doing right now? I'm okay. A little nervous, but one of these days. Why are you nervous? Uh, I guess it's just one of those, you know, one once in a lifetime experience. You are so right. <laughs> You're gonna kill it. Good job. Thank you, sir. The ceremony was beautiful, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. And I forgot to take video, so check out these photos. And no wedding ceremony would be complete without a grand exit. And this was a grand exit. When we first started talking to Brooke and Rico about shooting their wedding in Finland, we asked Rico if there was anything special or different about a Finnish wedding. He said no, it's pretty straightforward and standard. And Rico was wrong. The first big difference I noticed was at the reception. We had an MC, or a program director, and his name was Sam. The biggest difference in wedding traditions in Finland caught me off guard when I started seeing men with masks and weapons gathering outside the reception hall.
usually that's the time when we gonna drink like a lot of booze for the girl. Yeah. <laughs> so he has to do something to get her back? Yeah, we have to play those games. Tell me what's going on. Sam, tell me what's going on. You gotta you're gonna be surprised. <laughs> where's where where is she? I don't know, she left. Hey, she she awesome went with uh, <laughs> I love it. She she went with uh, bank robbers. Don't you remember? Is she okay? I, I'm sure like you know traumas are pretty to win her back. No, but I have insurance. That's the bounty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean you might have to win her back, you know. There are indeed some unique Finnish wedding traditions. For one, the bride is often kidnapped by the groom's friends, and in order to win her back, he must complete a set of tasks, or games per se. No one knows where or why this tradition became a thing, but it is. Tell me, tell me what's going on, bro. I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> I think he's trying to win me back. And I'm waiting here. Okay, drinking. let's go, let's go, let's go! <laughs> You're in our rest, Phil. <laughs> Watch out. I don't know what he's doing, just swear to God. I don't know what's happening. Give <laughs> all of that! <laughs> Another Finnish tradition is during the cake cutting. It's said that the first person to feel the knife cut all the way through and hit the bottom is supposed to stomp their foot. The person that stomps first is deemed the head of the household and in charge. Did you know the sauna came from Finnish tradition? Most homes and buildings in general have one in their country. But this is off topic from wedding traditions and just a fun fact and cool thing we got to experience while exploring Finland. Finnish people are known to be some of the happiest people in the world, but they're also some of the quietest. Rigo calls this Finnish quiet. During dinner, I noticed there was kind of a low hush throughout the reception hall. But Finnish people start to come out of their shells when you mention one or two things. A sauna or drinking. <laughs> you ready for the sauna? Yeah. High five. Two weeks overseas was a welcome vacation from Buzz Life. We had had three major breakdowns in the past few weeks, resulting in two new engines. We were eager to put this mess behind us. We had lucky engine number three, and the bus was ready to be picked up. But it only took one hour of driving before things started to go wrong. Okay, so we got to get out of this storm because the hail is coming down super hard. I'm worried about the solar panels getting damaged. Uh, I cannot lose those or we are so screwed. Holy cow. All right, I think we are uh, in the clear. Surprisingly, but only barely, we made it all the way back to our old hometown. And that's where we discovered another new engine was needed. <laughs> 